What's happening, everybody? Sam here with Fall Obsession coming to you guys with another podcast episode. Appreciate y'all tuning in. This week, I am going to be recording with Todd Sellen, who is our Fall Obsession staff manager up in Michigan, and we're going to be talking some archery. You guys are probably thinking, if you're a returning listener, hearing Sam talk about archery again, can't wait, right? I'm very passionate about archery. I, I love bow hunting and everything about it. And um, this conversation with Todd, we're talking about our new 2023 Omnias, the setups that we're running, our impressions on the bow, and the gear that we have. Um, really, really great setup, and I can't wait for you guys to hear our thoughts on it. But before we get into that, I got to say, podcast is driven by Ridge Rock Hunt Company. Derek and Lacey over there in Mississippi, they book hunts with vetted outfitters across the country. They have a strong network of um, vetted individuals that either they or somebody they know and trust has hunted with and had a good experience with. So if you're looking for that next adventure, you want to book with one of those outfitters that's known and trusted, give Derek a call. He'll work with you on everything that you need to do to get set up with them and uh, and try to figure something out that'll work for you. So Ridge Rock Hunt Company, go check them out. We're also partnered with the Outdoor Call Radio app, Outdoors Dan from Respect the Game TV. He has an app that you can download on your device where you can stream and listen to hunting shows, hunting podcasts on a loop every single day of the week. And he also has a couple of live shows a week that he does as well. You can also catch those live shows on his Facebook Live, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you haven't downloaded the Outdoor Call Radio app, go to the App Store or wherever that is on your Android and download it. Get on your phone and you can start listening to the shows. You'll catch Fall Obsession podcast on there on Mondays, same as our regular publications. Finally, if you guys are partnered or affiliated with your own outdoor brand or a great outdoor brand in the hunting industry and you want to advertise and promote that brand through this podcast, we want to talk to you. We want to discuss that opportunity for you guys. Go to fallobsession.com slash podcast. There is a form on there that you guys can fill out. And from there, you'll be in contact with our production team and we can start talking about our analytics, our numbers, advertising opportunities through the show and what all that looks like um, from you as a partner. So if you're interested or know somebody that's interested, please let them know and send them to fallobsession.com slash podcast. I'm going to stop rambling. We're going to the conversation. You guys are listening to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. Oh, you got her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoked him. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely get your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. Fall Obsession Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to another Fall Obsession Podcast episode. I'm Sam and I'm on here with our Fall Obsession staff manager from Michigan, Todd Sellen this week. Welcome back to the podcast, Todd. Thanks, Sam. Always always good to see you. Always good to hang out with you and uh you know, talk hunting and outdoor stuff. So oh yeah. It, to be back. It's yeah. it's been a minute too. I, I actually I recorded uh I recorded an episode at at the time we're recording. I recorded yesterday with Mike Teepee, um talking oh, okay. about some, some habitat stuff and everything that he's got going on up there and I thought, man, it's been it's been a minute since I recorded with some of our own guys. So I, that's why I was yeah. trying to get the schedule filled up a little bit with our own fall obsession family and get some check-ins going on and, and see where everybody's at. So yeah, glad to have you back on here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always, always glad to, to be on here. And like I said, hang out with you guys and, 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 you know, talk, talk outdoors, you know, a week ago, Andy and that just came together, you know, Andy texted yeah. me on Thursday last week and said, Hey, I'm, how far is I-80 from you? And I said, well, it's actually right along the Indiana-Michigan border, which we're about two hours away. It's about, you know, two hours, ten minutes, something like that. I go, we can find a spot to meet up. Well, it turned out that he was actually coming more north into Michigan. Oh. And so he was staying, staying the night at my house last Saturday, and we got to hang out. So that was really cool. It's always cool to see fall obsession staffers and hang out with them. So I know. Yeah. We, we, uh, We've got a strong network established and everything, and it's only growing and getting better at this point. But to your point, it's it's very cool to see people. Uh, I, I'm proud of our staff programs and and what folks like you have have developed them into because it's it's a it it's more than just a 
a status of a pro or field staffer, I feel like. I mean, to an extent, if that's all you want it to be, that that's all you can keep it if that's your own choice. But there's endless opportunities um, throughout the year for people to get involved, people to meet up in person, or especially once you establish those relationships like Andy did with you. Or I know, you know, last year he came down here and, hey, where, where are you at? Let's have dinner, you know. So yes. we, it's, it's yeah. easy to be able to meet up and, and do stuff like that and fun when we do, so it's that true family feeling that dynamic that we have and you know yeah so it's awesome to be part of so. absolutely well we'll talk a little bit more about our staff here later on this episode but um sure. as the title of this podcast alludes to um i want to talk a little bit of archery with you because uh several of our staff both of us included are rocking the new 2023 omnias from elite archery and mm-hmm. I wanted to sit down with you and talk to you, get your thoughts on the bow. Um, I, I know you've been, get, you got it rigged up. You've been shooting it. Yep. You've been getting some reps in with it. So I yep. want to talk to you about um, your thoughts on the on the bow itself, how it shoots, and and kind of where your head's at with it right now. Yeah, for sure, it's an incredible bow to start off with. You yeah. know, we, uh, you know, I had the ember, um, which which served its served its purpose. I wanted a shorter bow that was lightweight that it can move around in, in the tree and. And then my daughter grew into, uh, grew up uh, to a point where she needed a bow. So Heather gave her, uh, her bow, gave Tala her bow. Um, and then, so Heather needed a bow. So I said, well, why don't you take the ember? And so she took over the ember uh, last year. And so I was shooting my, my I, tra- I transitioned my target bow into a hunting bow last year. And so that's what I used. And so, um, so this year I have the Omnia. And, and man, you know, uh, last year when I was down there with you, we were shooting a lot of different, different elite bows and and you know the omnia uh was one of the bows that really stuck out to me uh simply because my thing is a lot of i i get it seems like every year i get to this point where i draw back and i get a hold and i got a hold and i got a hold and so for me it's really important to have a high percentage of let off and and certainly the the omnia has that that's the first thing that i noticed right out of the box um one thing and I've, I've been going back and forth with you and nick on how do I increase penetration on an animal? Mm-hmm. Um, because I've been struggling with that the last couple of years. Um, my, I haven't had a pass through in, in, geez, like I said, four or five years now. Um, not that I haven't put any deer down, but at the same time, I like that pass through simply because it's an easier blood trail. You know, it's, it's easier to find the deer as opposed to, you know, you're on your hands and knees scouring, looking for blood. But right. when you have a pass through, you have, you have, you have, uh, you know, a better blood trail. And so it makes it easier. And so that's what I wanted to get back to. I wanted to find a way to try to increase my chances of having a pasture. So I did things like um, increase my weight. I changed my arrows. I went to a deep impact arrow by by uh, Black Eagle. Uh, I was shooting the Outlaws, and the deep impact is a, it's a micro diameter, so it's a slimmer diameter, but it's a heavier arrow. It's a more um, heavier front forward. And so I'm looking to gain more kinetic energy you know, to, to gain that pass through ability. And so, and I did, I uh, did some tests with the different arrows that I had and certainly the deep impact had them had the most penetration. And so that was really cool. But going back to the Omnia, Omnia right out of the box, you know, like I said, I was looking for a bow that I could crank up to 65 pounds. My target bow was the most, my max, uh, max poundage on my target bow was 60, which I, which I cranked up last year, but I wanted to go even further. And so out of the box, I picked it up out of the box and I pulled back. I can hear my muscles going pop, 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 pop. I'm like, oh boy. I'm like, if this is 65, man, maybe I'm getting too old for this, you know, for two increase anyway. And I got it to full draw and I'm holding it. So even at full draw, I could hold it and hold it, hold it. I could hold it forever. And so then I finally let off. Um, so I took it to my lo- local shop. So that was a big thing I noticed right away, the let off, but, you know, like I said, it's about a, it's a 90% let off, so yep. I could hold it forever. And again, that's important for me because I always seem to get these deer that I get to full draw on us and they move or another deer walks in front. And so I got to hold and hold and hold. I don't like to, I don't like to draw and then let down. That's just way too much movement for me. You know, I want to hold as much as I can. But, uh, so I took my bow, I took the Omnia to the, the archery shop and, uh, the weight was actually set out of the box at 67 pounds. It's like 67.8 pounds or something like that. I'm like, huh, that makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, seven, you know, seven, almost eight pounds uh, more than what I'm used to. And so, like, yeah, that's why my muscles were, were cracking a yeah. little bit. So A little he- too heavy, yeah. Yeah, we set it down to 65, and, 
you know, it took a little bit, you know, of course I knew I had to get some arrows through. What do they say? It takes about a thousand arrows through to, to, to get it ready, you know, or you know, to get it feeling like it's, it's, a used bow, you know, instead mm -hmm. of fresh out of the box, because there was that one night I was texting you telling you my arrows were going left, going right, going up, down, you know, not hitting where a lot of it was, I think just because it was a new bow, it wasn't broken yet. So I had to break it in. Um, cause the next time or last time I went out and shot, it was pretty windy and my arrows were hitting true, hitting exactly where they, where they needed to within a, probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably I, I always equate it to like a skeet, you know what I mean? It's just a small little disc, mm -hmm. probably within that that frame from 50 yards. That was bullseye, 50 yards. I went out um, out of the house, went out to 50 yards, shot my Omnia, and I grouped my arrows within that little little disc area on the target. So that was really cool. So awesome. Uh, yeah. So I've gotten used to it. Gotten used to the weight change. Um, I love it. I love it. It's very accurate, lightweight. I love the let off, and I'm excited to see what happens when I get out there. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think part of it too. You were talking about your arrows being all over the place. You know, I mean, you do have to break a bow in a little bit, but I, I think also equally as much it comes down to you as a shooter getting used to the bow as well and and getting more yep. comfortable with it. Uh, you know, and and I I see that more more than I see just you know strings having to break in and stretch and stuff like that. Um, I see archers just having to get comfortable with their equipment more frequently than, than that. So I think that probably played a part in it too, but. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and even with me increasing it to 65, that again, that's five pounds more yeah. than what I shot, what I've been shooting. Um, and even last year I was, I increased it to two sixty. I was at 57 prior to that. So, you know, I've been gradually going up, trying to, again, trying to get that deep penetration on an animal because you, you want to clean uh, humane kill on the animal. And, and again, when you get a pass through, you get, you get an easy trail job as well. And so, um, that's, that was kind of my goal last year that I was looking for. And even in the off season here, that's, that's what I've been been playing around with to try to try to increase my my chances of having that pass through and getting that good penetration and so for me to increase it by five pounds again that that's an adjustment i need to make from my shooting you know i gotta i gotta adjust my um you know my technique to compensate for that extra extra weight so yeah yeah you, you were talking about your arrows and and going with the deep impacts and getting something with more penetration and stuff i i'm you know, I've in the past, early on in my archery career, I shot light everything because I I wanted the speed. My bow was a carbon bow. I I mm -hmm. shot a lightweight arrow. You know, and then I was I was trying to get all the speed I could, but to get a pass through was was not very common for me in that situation. And then yeah. when I affiliated at this time with an arrow company, you know, you're shooting those deep impacts. I've been shooting those eastern axis for a long time. The advantages with those impacts certainly is you have that higher FOC out there in front and everything um there is such a thing and i've seen it before there is such a thing in my mind as um too heavy of an arrow you know there is yep. a threshold that you cross if you're trying to build an arrow too heavy to where it's actually going to slow everything down to the point where you're going to lose penetration yep. but that's a pretty that's a pretty heavy weight that you got to get to to be there and then with this bow with the omnia too i think it just makes that transition you made to those deep impacts even greater um, oh, yeah. in, in a positive way, just because, right. um, this, this bow is built for comfort and speed. Like th this is, this is one of the, the first bows that elite has kind of been marketing a little bit more as a, as a speed rig, you know, not exclusively as such, but this is one of the fastest bows they've ever built. And yep. this cam system that they have and, and the way that this, like I pulled this bow out of the box and as soon as I put it in my hand, the first thing I felt it it felt and I don't know how else to describe it. It felt tight, like yes, I grabbed absolutely. it and I was like, yeah, absolutely. It, short brace height and just looking at the bow, having it in my hand, I was like, this thing feels in my hand like it is just primed and ready to fling it at a high rate of speed. <laughs> like yep. it it just I don't know what it was. I can't even describe it. It just it felt tight to me in that yep. sense. And then you start rigging it up and run arrows through it. It's quiet. And those arrows are just zinging out of there at just 
flying. Man, when they hit the target, when they hit the target, they pop, they smash the target. You know, that's that's one thing I noticed as well. When I hit, I have a bag I shoot at, and I have some other three D. I haven't shot into them yet, but shooting at the bag, you hear a pop. You know what I mean? You hear that arrow hit hard, and so I noticed the exact same thing. And so, like I said, when I felt it was tight, I'm like, man, this has got to be set at sixty five, the max, because that's that's the max that it says. And so that's why I was pulling back. And then I realized it was at 68. So that was, that was kind of cool. So, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about it, man. It's, it's just been, it's been fun getting to build them out. I'm building both mine and Nick's out. It's been pretty, pretty cool. Wow. And, uh, just getting to see, I don't know, just getting to experience it and getting more comfortable with it. It's, I, I've told people before, cause everybody hears you have a new bow and everybody, you know, that you, that you know is like, Hey, how's that new bow shooting? What do you think of that new bow? That new elite? And I tell people, I'm like, look, I don't want to sound cliche because we're partnered with them, sure. but I'm not kidding. I think this is the best bow I've ever owned. And they kind of sure. they kind of look at me like, really? I was like, yeah, really. I've yeah. I've shot, I've owned three different brands of bows. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been with Elite since 2018, and I just I told them I was like, I I feel like this is the best bow I've ever I have ever owned myself. Yeah. So. I 100% agree. 100% agree. When I uh, when I got my first bow, well, my my first bow was actually a Martin Martin Prowler, a big old heavy thing <laughs> that I got for my 17th birthday. And then 17 years later, I purchased my first bow, which was a Hoyt. Yeah. And the thing that drew me to Hoyt was I was shooting between Hoyt and Matthews was the fact that you could feel the power, you could hear the power in the arrows, you know. Um, um, and so uh, that's what I realized about. Omnia or the uh, the elite Omnia as well. You can feel the power in the bow. You can feel the power, and so that's that tight that we were tightness that we were talking about. You can feel it. It's going to zip the arrows pretty good. Yeah. Um. And then and then what attracted me to elite uh, to begin with was again that high let off. I didn't have that high let off, high percentage let off with my Hoyt. And so what I would do is I get to my set point, and if I get a hold, then I start sawing. And I didn't like the fact that I start sawing because now your technique and your form is all over the place and you're not set on that specific spot that you have to for your animal. And, you know, it was kind of inconsistent at times on where I hit the animal. And so I wanted to make sure that I was as consistent in the field as I was when I'm on the archery range. And so, yeah. again, when you have the high percentage let off, that's what helps with that. You know, that for me, that's what helps with that. And so that's what Elite provided that was different. You could feel the power that I felt in my Hoyt. But now you have the the high percentage of let off, and that's like I said, absolutely the best bow I've ever owned. So yeah. Um, did you go with the cable stops or the limb stops? Uh, I got the limb stops on mine. Yeah. So, yep. I, yep. I I did the same. Nick did the same with ours. I last my last elite the cure that I had, which oh. also a great bow that I did like a lot. Um, oh. I ran the cable stops on that one and it shot fine. It was good. I just, right. I, I wanted, I wanted that rock solid back wall on, on this yeah, one. Not, exactly not, what I wanted. not that the cable stops weren't, weren't solid. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have run cable stops on that cure if it, if they it hadn't been solid enough in my mind, but I wanted, I wanted to be locked when I was right. at full draw. And so I put those limb right. stops on there with this one. Right, and it's exactly why I went with it because when you get to that set point, boom, you hit it, and you're just locked right at your anchor point. Yeah, you know, I've shot bows before where you pull back and you get to the anchor point and you feel soft. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You feel like you could keep going, and I didn't like that at all. You know, I yeah. wanted to hit that anchor point and just boop, yeah, truly get anchored. You know, hit that wall. I've felt I've felt that before, uh, and I won't knock any brands. I, I think technology has improved a lot lately. Um, mm-hmm. a, a while back, like you know, eight. 12 years ago shooting bows it it definitely it was definitely more common i think to feel that and then i do feel like if you if you're an archer and you feel like your back wall is spongy in that sense the first thing to check is just your cam timing because more than likely one of your cams is out of time which just means that stop is one of them whether it's a limb stop or a cable stop whatever bow you have one of those is hitting on that cam before the other one is and that's where you get that sponginess is that second one trying to to catch up and you're overloading that first one even um gotcha. trying to pull through and get to that second one so that's where that spongy feel comes from which is why again my tip for any archer that might be listening to this and be like man my bow feels like that 
have go to your local shop and have them check your cam timing because that that's probably and that's an easy fix if that's the case so yeah for sure for sure yeah it man it's it's an awesome rig i'm super super pumped to be running it this year what what kind of accessories did you put on are you running on so yours? I put a, a CBA micro CBE microlight um, site that I have, and, and I went with the microlight site simply because it seems like the majority of my action always happens right at dark. And there have been times where I've gone out, uh, where I've sat in my stand, and I've had a nice buck come in. I can see vitals perfect, everything. They set up 20 yards broadside. I get my bow up, and I can't see my sights. I can't see my pins. So I decided to go with micro light simply because it has that light on top. And then it also has the five pins on it. Um, so I can shoot out to six, about 60 yards. Um, and not that I look to shoot out to 60 yards, but what I've also realized in my years of hunting is the biggest bucks always seem to hang out between 50 and 60 yards. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I've, I've made a, made an effort in recent years to make sure I feel comfortable out, out to 50 yards with my bow. And so, um, I wanted more than one pin just because that helps me with yardage. You know, we've talked about single pins on my archer, on my uh, my target target bow. I had one pin, and it, it shot it shot well. I was able to compensate with one pin up to 40 yards, but then I, you know, out to 50, 60 yards, it's a little harder to harder for me to compensate with one pin. So I wanted more than one pin, and then in my mind, I thought, you know, if I ever go out west archery hunting elk, muley, whatever you're probably going to have to take longer shots like that. And I don't want to have to sit there and try to think of where my pin needs to go. I just want to be able to put my pin on it, you know, get, get, get my shot off that way without having to think too much. You yeah. know what I mean? I just want, want that to, um, to roll through. Uh, I have an elite, um, uh, I have an elite, um, uh, I actually have a Scott archery. You, know, you got Scott archery hat, uh, Scott archery thing. Yep. The, Geez, I can't even remember what it was. I just had my oh right here. Nope, I lied. I had the list right here. I still do. So I had the uh, <laughs> I got the just the elite quiver. It's a pure pure white tail, and I picked the pure white tail just because it looked neat. I like the camel pattern. It's so, so I sharp, really yeah. like the camel pattern on it. Yeah, uh, I know you guys had a mixture of the the greens and the tans and stuff like that, and I just I just I just like that camel pattern. I got a uh, so um, the the elite carbon stabilizer and then of course the omnia um Are you oh, the tail end of release. I, I was thinking fang but it's actually the tail end release so the scott archery tail end release gotcha. and i use that because i like the hook i like the hook i don't like the calipers yeah. you know what i mean because for me sometimes if you're if, when you get to the anchor point and if you happen to put pressure one side or the other it might hit one of the side of the calipers which might throw your string off a little bit which now throws your arrow off a little bit yeah i just like a single the single hook to be able to loop into my my loop my knock loop and then just release it and it goes straight you I, know i've always been a fan of of the hooks um i i still carry whenever i so before i shoot a thumb release now um, yeah. but before I switched over to that, that, and it's an Exus core, which is from many years ago, it's a Scott product, but I'm still, I'm still running it mainly because I'm just, I'm the kind of guy, like if, if I didn't get a new bow this year, I'd still be running that cure. And if I didn't ever yeah. get that cure, I'd probably still be running the ritual before it. Like I'm the yeah. kind of guy that once, once it's working, I don't mm -hmm. like to switch. That's why I've had the same release for going on. I, I think this year is like year six or seven with, with that release. I've been shooting the same arrows for almost 10 years. Like I just, it, you know, if it's something I like and that's working, I, I keep it and it sticks around. But before I switched to that core, I was mm -hmm. shooting a Scott. Um, and, and back then I forget what version it was, but uh, sure. a hook release as well. And sure. I remember switching when I switched to that hook release, it was just, I, I was so much more comfortable with it than I was with the calipers. So, right, right. Yeah, me too. And like I said, and that's, that's what I realized, you know, trying to, trying to be as accurate as I possibly can. That was one of the things I switched, went from the calipers to the hooks. And then I realized that my accuracy improved quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and then with that, I have the wrist strap. I don't have, I don't have the thumb release. You yeah. know what I mean? I have the wrist strap. And for me, because uh, I use it simply because I thought, Originally, when I switched to the wrist strap, I thought, you know, I don't have to have pressure. I don't. Ha I'm not pulling with my fingers. I'm pulling with my whole arm. If that strap is wrapped around my wrist, I can pull with my whole, whole arm. Well, one thing I, I I threw around the idea of going with with the thumb release this year, simply because I originally, like I said, out of the box, I didn't realize it was set at 68. I thought it was 65. I was having a hard time pulling. 
Um, and then when they adjust it, adjusted it, it went to 65. I have this tool that I, this little digital scale tool yeah. that you showed me last year when I was down there. I went and bought one of them and realized how easy it is just to hook it, grab it, and pull it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hook it. Hook it, grab it, and pull it. Somebody just let the dog in. <laughs> That's dog okay. Let himself in. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I realized how easy it was to pull it, so I thought, well, do I do I switch to that thumb release? And so I decided not to. I ended up sticking with the wrist release and just getting the reps. And yeah, I'm perfectly comfortable with it now. And so I'm back to feeling. I'm feeling feeling like I've shot this thing forever, you know. And I love it. I love I love the way it feels. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move. Actually, I got a release, but it's sitting behind my camera here, so I gotta jump over here real quick and snag it. Gotcha. I hate doing that on the podcast, but I wanted. To, so uh, right. this showed up unexpectedly in the mail um, oh, from gotcha. Elite or the Outdoor Group. They're wanting uh, me to demo it and see, because again, I shoot a thumb, but this yep. is it's called the Verge, okay. and it's it's a. I'll try to get it so you can see it there. It's a yep. hook. But it yep. has it has two slots for your fingers, fingers and it it's a trigger, like this is a trigger, but uh -huh. it almost shoots like a back tension almost, which is very, okay. very interesting to me. Um, right. so I, I'm I gotta get this out and play with it. I wanted to get comfortable with my Omnia first and shooting yep. it and, and being you know good with it before I went and started playing around with a different release. I'm still gonna hunt this year with my with my thumb release but i don't know i'm really big on like follow through on your shots and you yep. know not punching your trigger and yep. like when i shoot with a thumb release i mean yep. I, my my pinky finger just hangs loose because it's just a three finger so my thumb right. is on the trigger and i almost like i'm bringing my thumb in but i'm almost closing my hand like this i'm almost just closing yep. my hand into a fist and pulling yep. through my shot when i when i release with it and that's something that I've worked really hard on with my with my release, and I also prefer a very, I like a very sensitive trigger, which I know is not everybody's fan either. But I don't want any travel in that trigger. I want to be able to right. place my thumb in, on it, and as soon as right. I start squeezing, I'm releasing. Is just right. my my personal preference and how it works with my mind. So, I'm interested sure. to to play See, around with this. That's a trigger, but functions like a back tension and is kind of does. I mean. Target archers, I'm sure, will use it, but I think it's meant to. And it's a wrist strap. Make, wrist strap, yep. It's maybe yep. meant to kind of satisfy those those hunters that are that like that back tension concept, but still want to yep. shoot a wrist strap with a hook. So I don't know. Um, it like I said, it showed up, and I I sent Larry McCoy a text. I was like, Hey man, you sent <laughs> me something that I didn't order. He's like, Yeah, you need to play around with it and see what you think and and film oh, some videos. Go. So I was like, All right, yeah, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it a shot. That thing, yeah, I'll give review. it a shot. So I gotta yeah. like I said, I'm just now to the point with my bow where I'm like, All right, I think I can start. You know, maybe messing around with you know stuff like this and you know be okay. I wanted to make sure I was super comfortable before I threw another release into the mix. Started messing with my mind. So. Gotcha. But, yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like you said, you find like you said, you find what's comfortable and you, you try to stick with it, you know, as much as you can. And I just started tinkering around with some things this past year, just to, just because I had, um, you know, more goals in mind. You know, I, I've noticed some things with some of the changes I made in recent years that I wanted to try to get back to, you know, getting getting full penetration and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The other the other thing I'm having to adjust, and I'm. I'm a little late to the party with this was I decided later on to change my, my site setup. Uh, okay. because when I rigged up my Omnia, I uh -huh. put my, my engage hybrid from CBE yep. on there that I had yep. on my cure. Cause I love that site. It's a five pin site with the, with the elevation tape and the adjustment. So you like yep. your 60 pin is your floater. Yep. Shoot out to a hundred yards, exact yardages. I love that site. Right. Um, they sent me a Trek, pro two pin site which is okay. also has the tape and the elevation adjustment but it yeah. has two pins and they're both floating pins so oh, wow. if you put your like if you put your tape at mm -hmm. 20 yards mm -hmm. I'll make i believe i'm explaining this right i'm, I'm still learning <laughs> if you put your tape at 20 yards um 
it's it's good. Your first pin's twenty, and your second pin's thirty. If you put your if you adjust your sight all the way down to or, or how it whatever that distance ends up being, if you adjust your sight down to let's say thirty yards, well now it's thirty and forty, and it goes like okay. it's built all the way through what it, like your max. Like you could have a a ninety and a hundred potentially on that thing. Yeah. So. I was very intimidated and I rigged it up with my engage because I was like, I don't know if I want to mess with that. I was right, very exactly. timid and I like it sat in my office for, and if Larry McCoy listens to this, he's probably going to be laughing and, and cussing at me at the same time. But it sat in my, <laughs> it sat in my office for like two or three weeks because I was just intimidated by it. I was like, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can go, go to that. And so finally I pulled it out and I was playing around with it. It is lighter lighter weight than my engage it's still completely metal and everything though. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this. So yes. late to the game, I decided to make the switch to a different site and rig that, uh, rig just that, with two pins, huh? Rig that Trek on there. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's different. It's taken some getting used to. I, I think I'm going to like it. I think I'm going to run it, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was a little intimidating at first. So what do you have them set at? You have the first pin twenty thirty, and then the then forty fifty. Yeah. Is that what, so? Is that what you I, got? I have a I have a ten yard increment, and my thought my thought with that too is well, if if I'm shooting, like if I have a deer, the thought process. Let me back up behind the engage with the five pin. Right was right. I'm gonna right. have out to 60 already there. So anything yep. 60 and under, like I can shoot my pin gaps in between and stuff like that, but. The thought with this is, well, if I have a deer floating in that 20 to 30 range, hypothetically, if my if my tape is set right, then mm-hmm. I can shoot the pin gap between those two pins. If I yeah. have them floating between 40 and 50 or 45 and 55, whatever it is, I can move my dial and, again, sure. have that 10-yard range to be able to shoot, excuse me, shoot my pin gap For sure. between those two marks. So I... Yeah. I know we've talked on the podcast before with Mike Teepee about his right. single pin mentality, and yeah. he's a big yeah. fan of the single pin, and he talked Nick Powell into the single pin. So Nick's running yeah. a single pin. Uh, same side I have now, the, the Trek Pro, but he's got a single pin. Um, gotcha. And I just, I haven't, I, I shot a single pin way, way long time ago. Probably, mm-hmm. and, and, and I was novice enough, I didn't know how to use it properly, and so it, was, it didn't work out great for me. But I've never gone right. back. Never right. really wanted to because I've always thought, well, I don't – my just in the back of my mind, it's like, well, I don't want to have to adjust every time something changes. That's just – that's the thought yeah. I can't get out of my head, right? So yeah. with this two-pin, I was I finally was like, you know what? This this is, might be the closest I ever go to going back to a single pin, but we're going to give this a shot and, and see how well this works. So. You know, and as you were ex- explaining this, my thought was, well, geez, that's a single pin mentality with, with two pins. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's exactly. The, fur- the further they go out, you're still not raising that one pin up. Now you can switch down to the second pin. And yeah. and so, yeah. And for me, I, I use a single pin in, in target shooting uh, during the competitions and and probably the farthest distance you shoot is at about 45, maybe 50 yards, but the 50 yard shots are on these huge elk targets, you know what I mean? Or moose targets or something like that. And still, and so you're still not, comp- you're not shooting a deer, you know, a deer as the further they get out, the smaller the, the area is that you're really aiming for. And right. that's what threw me off. But, um, you know, I, I used years ago, I used a single pin out in the field too. And just like you, I had a hard time adjusting or I found myself fiddling with trying to, trying to adjust it and move it to, and by that time, by the time I got it set, the deer were moving off. And so I just thought that's just, that's too much work. I gotta, I gotta be able to get a pin and just put it right on them and be able to get my arrow off. So that's why I switched. Originally I switched to a, a three pin site. Um, so I had 20, 30 and 40, and now I went up to a five pin site, um, probably about three or four years ago, simply because, you know, in my mind, I thought someday I'm going to go out West. So I'm going to need to be able to shoot out to 60 yards. And so, um, you know, when I was, when I was shooting target and, and participating in competitions, I haven't in the last couple of years, just because we were so busy in the summertime. But, um, when I was doing that, I had a target bow set up with a single pin simply because you're not shooting at 50, 60 yards uh, consistently. And, and targets in the classes that I shot were 40 max, you know what I mean? It was easy to adjust a single pin. But um, um, on my on my 
And so I had a target bow and then I had a hunting bow and on my hunting bow, I have the five pins set up. So that was part of what I adjusted with my target bow last year. I switched the, I had a, I had a true ball, uh, extension, um, XL, um, it's like a eight, eight inch extension, uh, sight on it with a single pin. I switched that out for the, the micro micro light with the five and the light on it. Yeah. So, so I have, and Heather's bow has that micro light on it as well. I just love it. I just love it simply because you can flip that light on when it gets close to dark. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I mentioned this in a previous podcast. So my only concern is if I flip it on and there's a deer coming from behind me, can they see that light when I flip it on? I don't know. I, I don't know. I have no idea. So. Yeah, I, I mean, so you have with these lights, at least from CBE, you know, you have you have two. It, it's it, it's a fade, right? So if if right. you start from the low setting and turn it all the way up, it gets brighter and brighter, and then eventually it just rolls back over and shuts off. So right. you can go back and turn on high to start, or you can go forward and turn on low. I, I encourage right. anybody to get in the habit of tur- making sure you have the muscle memory to turn it the direction you want to yeah. turn it, which in low light should be low. You don't need it beaming high. If it's dark outside, the low is going to give you all the illumination you need. The high yeah. is, is meant more for like people who have a, a one, one thousandths pin size or a, a mm-hmm. yeah. Point oh, make sure I'm saying that right. Point oh one or, or how, <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, you know, I exactly what you're saying. You yeah, know what I mean. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. people do. Yeah. I'm confusing myself, but um, yeah. the the one nine people that have the bigger the bigger size pins, you know, obviously they're gonna they're gonna hold a little bit more light. They're gonna be just a little bit brighter to the eye. But if you are shooting, and this is probably gonna be the most common for somebody, if you are shooting in broad daylight but shooting towards the sun, like if it's yeah. morning and you're shooting east, um, yeah. and you have those smaller pin sizes. Well, just with the glare from the sun, you might not be able to see your pins very well, which yep. in broad daylight, you can turn that light on the high setting and it'll illuminate them at those small pins to the point where you can right. see them a lot better. So, yeah, I've had it before shooting, like you said, into that sun and, and my, my pins light up so much <laughs> that you look through your peep that, that, that color is filling up your entire peep and it's like, Oh, you know, yeah. you to try to figure out how to get it out of the sun a little bit so yeah. you can see the animal that you're trying to aim. I've always had my floating pin, which is my bottom pin in these five pin sites that I've had up until now. I've always had it as the smaller pin size. And mm-hmm. this year with that with that trek that they sent me, both pins are the smaller size. So that was oh, the other thing that was discouraging for me as I opened it up inside the house. I was like, I was holding it out in front of me. I was like, my eyes aren't that bad. I, c- I can't right. even see those pins. And so I, I was, it was super confusing to me because I was like, I've never had this problem before. And finally, right. I t- when I took it outside and got in natural light and full sun, I was like, oh, I can see them now. That's what, yeah. That had me worried yeah. for a second. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, my, mine is my age, so that's why I asked you about that lens, you know. Yeah. I asked you about the lens a couple of weeks ago, and, and so it was, you know. Like I said, I'm hitting consistently, so I don't, you know, I just, I just thought it might make it easier if I had the lens to be able to magnify everything. I just didn't know if if, if a CBE had a lens for the micro light. So yeah, um, I saw they had them for the other ones, the Trek and the hybrid and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, we'll figure that out. The yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting year, and I'm certainly excited with the bows that that our group has gotten set up with. It's it's going to be pretty cool. It, it was funny because. I think you, you, Drew, and uh, Nick Latham, y'all all got camo versions. I think Drew, yeah. I don't remember what pattern Drew got. You and Nick might have gotten the same pattern. I don't, I'm, I'm the pure white tail. Yeah, I'm not, sh- not I don't yeah, remember yeah. on that. But then Nick Pal and I, our bows are identical. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Same, same draw length, same draw weight, same color, oh, same accessories. So when we were rigging uh-huh. them up, it's like, all right. What accent colors are you gonna do, and what accent colors am I gonna do? Yeah. So he went with green, I went with orange, so we can at uh-huh. least, if they're side by side, we can tell them apart. Because other than that, right. again, they're identical. So mm-hmm. that was, and and people like looking at us like, oh, y'all are Twinkies, y'all, yeah. y'all decided to do that because, <laughs> almost, almost. yeah, is that the Texas dirt bow or what's going on with that? And it's like, no, I, I was like, I put in my order and he sent me what he wanted. And it was yep. exactly the same. Like we didn't, so, we didn't plan it. So next time we see Nick, he's gonna have a handlebar just like you. And 
no that that's the that's the one thing that uh and when he listens to this he'll laugh but that's the one thing he can't do he can't grow a mustache to save his life so <laughs> <laughs> okay so we'll have the half handlebar <laughs> yeah there you go no um yeah my accents i try to go with fall obsession colors just because i wanted to i wanted to rep you know just I, I love the black and orange orange concept that we have with the company and so uh, they didn't have any orange, <laughs> so oh, no. I ended up going ended up going with blue and red. So I got a blue and red concept for access because I thought, well, elite elite their main color is blue, so I'll, I'll keep that blue. Yeah. And then I threw some red on there just because um, when I'm pulling my my peep is red, so I thought pulling my peep anything that makes it stick out a little bit more. It takes a lot of thinking out. If you can just yeah. you can see the red coming right out your face, you can get your ink anchor point right away. And yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, I well, want blue and red for my accent colors. So. Yeah, I, I've evolved. I uh, I've always been like on my bows. Just ever since my first bow, it's always I've always blacked everything out. I've always been big on on just mm-hmm. you know the the ninja black. Even if the bow itself, like my cure was green, all right. my my servings and everything on it was black. Um, yep. And then my arrows. I went through a phase. I, at first, I just take whatever blazer veins came on them when I bought the arrows and everything. And then when I started flexing right. my own arrows, I was like, I want these things to be crazy. So for yes. two, three years, my go-to fletching color was a neon yellow wrap and neon pink fletchings. I was like, I'm oh, gonna be able to yes. find these. I, like, I don't care if they're pink. I'm gonna find these wherever they go. And, for sure, you don't even light a knock at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They glow in the dark on their own. And then yeah. I, uh, that's when, after that, I switched over to the pure white. And for a while, I ran my fletchings just all three pure white um, all the way through. Right. And so this year was my first year going back to, uh, to some accent colors. So I did all my, I did all my, you know, my peep and my uh, D loop and all the, all the, tie-in points and stuff on my bow and everything i did all those orange and then when i refletched my arrows this year i went neon orange as well so neon orange that's cool that's cool yeah yeah Yeah, they had uh they had uh the peep red blue or black i'm like oh i just had blue in my old bow i'll go with i'll go with red this time and then like i said just because i was looking for orange because i thought the brighter color would be easier to to find it without having to focus on finding it you know Uh, you know but you shoot enough you you don't really have to focus on that anyway you know yeah and so but um, thought it'd be cool, and I, I've done that for a couple of years now. I, I matched the bow color with the peep color. I've done, I've done different. I've been thinking around like that just because I like, I like, you know, having different types of accents to go and stuff. So I just think it's cool. So yeah, for sure. So when people, so when people, when you set your bow up, you have options. <laughs> you have several <laughs> options. So <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's where that's where you see guys guys nerd out most of the time guys are like ah, i don't i don't care what color it is just you know yeah. wh- whatever yeah. I, I don't care but the yeah. two things that i see guy or I, I guess i'll say three things that guys are picky about with their colors are their trucks their guns and their bows <laughs> yep. Yep. exactly exactly so yep yep yeah we were, we were yeah heather wants to repaint our bedroom what color do you want doesn't really matter whatever you want baby <laughs> whatever you want <laughs> yeah well todd um uh, so, we are like i mentioned you're at the beginning when we introduced you you're a staff manager and i know you've been yep. on here before even though it's been a minute you you uh yep. you are the the guy that makes everything happen in in the realm of our staff programs and stuff so um yeah, sure. what i'll i'll turn it over to you and let you talk a little bit about kind of where where we're going with with some stuff this upcoming fall where we're going we have you know we have the series going you have texas dirt we're working on right now um in our last meeting we had a couple of weeks ago um you know getting couch chats going again we got a couple ideas floating around right now to try to get that up and try to incorporate more people from from various regions um getting more people involved in in couch chats as well and so we have a couple ideas floating around with that so we're trying to get that help you out and get that going again um our staffer programs, um, you know, we have, what do we have, like four in the loop, four new staff that we're, we're going through the process right now with. So and it seems like recently we've been getting, you know, applications in daily. And so that's that's kind of cool. I think everybody's starting to get into that mentality that hunting season's come around. Yeah. How do I get more involved in the outdoors? Oh, wait, I can get involved in the outdoor industry. And so, yeah, we've had a, geez, I want to say we've had probably 
um, close to 10 applications in the last two weeks. So, I mean, uh, we have a whole bunch that are floating in right now. And so that's cool. And we're, we're getting our name out geez, through, through carbon TV, um, you know, through our YouTube, through our series that we have going on. We have our name out there nationally. We have, uh, Bradley just texted me, uh, this past week. He said he was up in Nova Scotia and he was at his local pro shop and he had, uh, a follow up session uh, had on, and he said a guy came up and said, Hey, I listen to those podcasts. So that's in Nova Scotia, Canada. So that's, that's awesome. Like man. I said, we're getting our name out. We're getting our name out. And it's, it's very exciting to see how fast and how far we're starting to grow. Um, and our staffers continue to do just an awesome job creating content and getting that content sent in. And then, of course, we're able to publish that and, and continue to to brand ourselves and, and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy our experiences with 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 our audience. And so that's a, that's a really cool thing. And so, like I said, so our staff, you know, our furthest east, Eastern staff members in Nova Scotia are for, for this Western, I believe is in Colorado. We have one in the loop that's from Washington state. We're kind of working on right now. So, yeah. um, so we're coast to coast, you know, uh, we're North to South. So yeah. we're all over the place. So it's, it's really cool. It's really exciting. It's really cool. And, and after I recorded yesterday with Mike TP and, um, yeah. him and I hung out after we were done, uh, you know, recording yeah. for a while and talking about stuff and just, just seeing the, you know, the evolution of, of fall obsession and where the brand has gone in just the past several years. It makes me excited for the next few years. And just, just to see, uh, you mentioned Bradley up there in Nova yeah. Scotia. We had a similar experience when Nick and I were at cinnamon Creek setting up uh-huh. our rigs, um, down here, like uh, cinnamon Creek is, is great friends of ours and they let us use their tech room and everything to, to rig our yeah. stuff up. And we, I mean, we, you know, polite, politefully and quietly stay out of their way, you know, in the meantime, but we're rigging okay. these two bows up, and this one guy comes up to us, and he's like, uh, and I, I forget what what I was wearing, like what I was repping at the time, but he comes up sure. and he's like, "Hey, y'all are the y'all are those fall obsession guys, right?" And my <laughs> Nick Nick, like we both just kind of stopped and looked at each other, like, That's "Wait, right. wait, what's <laughs> what's happening?" <laughs> right, we, right, we didn't expect right. it at all, especially at the bow shop that you go to all the time. You know, you yeah. you just you just it, it just doesn't happen like that. So he's like, yeah, I, I listen to the, I listen to the podcast and I've watched y'all's shows and everything. He's like, y'all, y'all are doing good stuff. And he, he was like super excited to meet us. And it, it yeah. just, it yeah. felt backwards to me. It was, it was not, it, yeah, it didn't, like, yeah, I, I just, just like, I'm like, okay. I didn't know what to say. I was like, okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I, 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 Keep <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your support. Yeah. So we had that at uh, crane camp last year when we were out in, um, in, uh, uh, Lubbock, Texas, those guys that were in the lodge next to us, we explained, we were talking to them and they're like, Hey, you got a group of guys. Like, yeah. We met through fall obsession. They're like, Oh, you guys connected through fall obsession. We're like, yeah, we're staffers. And Oh my gosh, we watch fall obsession all the time. And they were from the Houston area. And so that was a, a cool connection we made with, with that group as well. They, they, they watch our podcast and stuff. And so, you know, and that was my first sense of, wow, we, we really do have our name out there. And that's, that's really cool. And it's very exciting to, to see that we're growing so much. So it is. And then just also, and talking a little bit about our staff and our staff programs, just the, the quality of individuals that make up of our staff, just the good mm-hmm. people that we have are, are incredible. And I, I was thinking about this after I recorded with Mike and after we got off the phone last night, um, I was just kind of sitting down and reflecting about it and thinking about it. And I, we talked about uh, habitat management and a bunch of stuff relevant to that. And if you guys sure. are listening to this podcast, it's probably the episode before this one, if you guys want to listen to it. But um, we're, we're talking about it, and, and or I'm thinking about it, I should say. And I thought, man, I've gotten... I've had the privilege of being able to record with a lot of cool people, but a lot of very smart people in the realm of whitetail management through this podcast. Yeah. And I started thinking about, okay, who, who are the people that have really made an impact on me through whitetail management? And I was thinking yeah. about, you know, Emily Shad, um, outdoors, Dan from respect the game, yeah. e- even like Derek Eves from Ridge rock. All, all those people yeah. are very smart when it comes to whitetails and whitetail behavior. But then I was like, you know what? Everybody always, like for a show host or a podcast host, you always want to go out and get the big name. You always want to get a big name guest on your show and and stuff like that. You you want, you want that, that reach, you want that knowledge that they have and stuff. 
Yep. And Mike TP, just in my mind, he's probably one of the smartest guys I know when it comes to whitetail management. And the fact that we have him on our staff as a part of our fall obsession family Mm -hmm. and on our show so often and everything, I'm like, man, I I can't beat that with any big name guests. The, the, right. the knowledge and, and the, what he has to bring to the table when it comes to whitetail management. I, don't get me wrong. I'd love to have big name guests on here to, to talk about that stuff too, but mm-hmm. I, there's no, there's no tier above what, what he's able to bring to the table in my mind, at least. Well, it, sorry, go ahead. Well, and, and I was just going to say, it's so cool because just across the board with our staff, if you want to know something like you can pick up the phone and call somebody. I mean, sure. yeah, like if I want to know anything about elk hunting, I'm calling Tim Burgess is my first phone call. Yep. If I want to know yep. anything about whitetail management, whitetail habitat, whitetail behavior, Mike Teepee and Tyler Wolf are both probably going to get a phone call from me. Yeah, like, exactly. It's it's all just within our own house, and it's super, super cool that we have that, we have that going on over here. And what's exciting to me about our staffers, uh, all the talents and all the skills that they possess, um, not just – you know, going out and hunting and, and managing, but you know, like I said, we've talked about technology. For example, you got Nick who runs the the production uh, production department, but you have several other staff members. You mentioned Tyler. Tyler, that's what he does for a living, and and to see his skills come out and. When we film when we're on uh, in camp, for example, that that crane hunt when we filmed when we we're actually at camp, he was he was directing us and telling us what shots we need to have and and what we need to talk about and hey, we'll go back and 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 remember how you mentioned this, go back and expand upon this. So he was really the the director of that production, and so that was that's really cool to see that Audrey down in down in Audrey Topping down in Florida, she yeah. has a lot of really good skills, a lot of good writing skills. We talked about Tony Dimick out in um, in Colorado and how his ex expertise are in the fishing world and so it's really really cool how we all possess certain qualities that are um we're all like-minded in terms of conservation in terms of the outdoor but we all also have separate qualities that really mesh and bring us together to really form a cohesive group and and help us to continue to grow and help us to get our product out there and help us to get our name known and it's really cool like i said super exciting and like you said you have several different resources, several different staffers that if you need to know anything, all you gotta do is pick up the phone and call them or just pick up a phone and text them. And, yeah. and that's the other thing about our staffers. You text them, they, they respond right away. It's not like it's not like sometimes, you know, when you're trying to contact somebody through the business world, it takes a day or two, you know. Or, to, or to, me. To, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm horrible well. at texting. I'm horrible. <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, so you, you know what I'm saying, but it's, it, it's just really awesome to have that resource. And that, that's a big part of why I, I wanted to become a part of fall obsession to, to be able to have those resources, to be able to expand myself as a hunter and, and grow myself in the outdoor world. So, yeah, it, it's an awesome journey. It's far from over. And yeah. I, I'm excited, like I said, to see where everything goes, not just for the brand, but for our staffers and, and all that kind of stuff. This we're, we're about to start a new staffing year. And it's gonna it's year number nine, with uh, yeah. with a some form of staff program, which is which is pretty incredible yeah. too to to think That's about crazy. that and how far we've come. And um, I know I know you and Heather came on the scene year two or three or somewhere in there having yep. the staff program. But I I yep. always like to mention it. We our first field staff in 2015 was made up of ten people. And out of those yeah. ten people, there are still two that are on our roster. So I think that's that's pretty awesome as well. That's pretty cool, yeah. And with these new applicants that are coming in, I've seen this several times already. Just the way that we bond with each other, that they 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 want to become a part because there's a question on there: Why do you want to be part of Fall Obsession? And the most common answer is because I see how you guys bond with one another. I see how you guys use your resources, and and you know I see how you have mentorships to help each other. You know, there's a lot of things about the outdoor in- industry and outdoor world that I don't know. Like you mentioned, you know, white, white tail management, you know, you go to Michael, Michael's, you have certain experts, you know, it reminds me of my career, you know, as a teacher, um, I have a special education degree. So my expertise are in the field of special education, you know what I mean? And so if I need to know about curriculum in English, for example, 
I go to Heather because that's her expertise. Say, right. hey, Heather, I got this idea. What do you think? Where do I go? Where do I get these resources? Same thing in, in follow-up session. If we want to, we have all these people with different expertise, and it's just a really, really cool opportunity and resource. And so, um, you know, and we, we're always looking to grow as well. And so, um, it, it's a lot of fun, and 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 that's why that's a big part. I want to I want to feel that family atmosphere and be able to share ideas and and grow myself as a hunter. So. Yeah. And to that point too, just for anybody that's listening to this that is is interested in learning more, um, I mean, you've heard Todd and myself talk about the the family atmosphere and how we we try to make this more than you know if you're on our team, you're more than just a a number and a system or just another another dude on Instagram with a field staff tag next to his name. Um, so. We, we try to make make this family we try to get everybody involved we have we have everything structured down to where as I mentioned Todd is our staff manager so he he's over the whole kit and caboodle of the staff programs but then under him we have regional coordinators in the five US regions that are you know just kind of head up that that region and any activities or hunts or events that um, or group projects whatever the case might be yeah. that are that are relevant to those areas and so um, we, we try to provide those resources and put the right individuals in those spots to where, you know, they can, they can help our other staffers along and, and mentor them and help them in, in content creation and, and all that kind of stuff. So if you guys are interested in becoming a part of the team, um, we're, we're looking for people all over for sure. But I mean, especially in, in some of the Southern States and the Western States, Western we, States, we, yeah. uh, we really want to bolster some numbers out there. So if you're from those, either of those areas and you're interested, um, definitely consider it. But we, uh, we, we do take our, our application process, uh, seriously. It's more than just yeah. filling out an app. Part of that application process through various things that we do is we try to get to know you and, and, and understand like why, why you want to be a part of, of the team and, and why you, what you want to do in the industry and um, with your content and all that kind of stuff. Those, those are key parts of our process as well because, again, like we just said, we have a roster made of some pretty incredible people. We want to continue sure. to add in, incredible people to that roster and, you know, um, Again, we don't want anybody just to be a number in a system. So if you guys are interested, exactly. fallobsession.com is the website, and you can navigate to it pretty easily from there. So, And I, and I want to kind of reiterate what you had mentioned. It's it's a multi-step process. You know, I've, I've had some I didn't understand, and so I just want, to, I want our audience to know that it's a multi-step process. Mm -hmm. Just be patient, you know, and we'll work through the process together. So, um, you know, and it's just because we are growing our brand so much and we are getting our name out there that we have to look, we have to try to get those that fit the best within within our company, within Fall Obsession, and that, that's what we're looking for. We're always looking for staffers, but just understand that it is a multi-step process. It's not a matter of filling the application out and you're automatically on staff. Yeah. You know? And, and, and I've over the years in, in the past, I've, I've been part of those groups where you did just fill an application. All right, you're good to go. Welcome. And yeah. you know, here's your 10% discount code or yeah. whatever, you yeah. know, but, uh, yeah. they, it, it's like Todd said with the steps and everything, we want to get to know you. We want to see your content. We want to understand, you know, who you are and where you're coming from. Todd even goes as far as to like, he himself will have a, a virtual interview with you over zoom. Um, I, we say interview it's, it's, it's a pretty laid back conversation, but again, yeah. to the point, we want to get to know you to bring you on our team. So, um, to Todd's point, just be patient with us through that process and everything. If you're interested in joining. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, and, and, I, you know, I think of where we're at and I, I look at different regions and I think, geez, we have a lot of untapped areas, you know what I mean? There, there's, you know, I'd love to go up to Washington state and do some blacktail hunting, for example. I would love to do that, you know, yeah. uh, go down to Arizona and do some goose, goose deer hunting, you know, that would be cool too, or javelina hunting, you know? Yeah. So. I, I mean, and, and there's plenty, we've talked on the podcast before also just about how there, there are plenty of ways you, if you want to go on a hunt in another state and you're unfamiliar with the process, a lot of people just, you know, they see shows, they see online, they're like, well, I got to go with an outfitter and it's going to cost me a bunch of money. It's not always the case. I mean, sure, you no. could go with an outfitter if you wanted to and you had the money, but there are right. definitely cheaper ways to do it. And that's one thing that I've learned as our, our staff has expanded. Because, and, yeah. and on top of that, you know, there there's 
there's invitations going around for sure, which was foreign to me from Texas because like down here, everybody is super locked down with their places and yep. you, yeah. you don't invite a whole lot of people to hunt where you hunt down here in Texas. Exactly. That's just how it works down here. But right, right. the generosity and the hospitality from, from other areas of the country is a lot different in a good way as it should be. And mm -hmm. Like for the past several years, I've, I've told Nick Powell several times, I was like, man, we, we get, we as just a group, as Fall Obsession in general, everybody, we all get invited to go so many places every single uh -huh. year. Like, I, I can't do it, <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and, 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 and that's, and that's the thing because, and I know you yeah. are, you're on top of it too, with trying to put stuff together with, you know, you know, bear hunts, crane hunts, snow goose hunts, yep. deer hunts, you know, all, all this other d different kind yep. of stuff that, that you, that you try to help bring to the table and stuff. And then, you know, like this year, Michael and I are going to hunt with Tim. We're going to hunt mule yep. deer in Colorado, which I'm yep. pumped about, but I would say, you gotta be excited for that. I, I'm excited. getting more excited by the day for sure. We're going to do a <laughs> podcast beforehand and talk more about it, but it, uh, are you archery or rifle? So I'm archery. Okay. Um, I have a deer archery tag, which I believe okay. is good for either a mule deer or a whitetail. Michael, okay. yeah. Michael has a whitetail tag that he can kill with any weapon, gun or bow. So, okay. If it's, a, if it's a muley, I'm getting first dibs. If it's a whitetail, <laughs> he's getting first dibs. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be a blast. It's always, always, always really nice getting together. Yeah. Uh, Fisher, Cass, Cass Fisher and I, uh -huh. we're headed to North Carolina in December, uh, to go after one of the, uh, one of the North Carolina Bruins. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear that they're pretty big. It's kind of unique in North Carolina. I spoke to the guy that we're hooking up with down in North Carolina and I said, well, do I really have to get a deer tag? Can I just get a bear tag? Because it's, the deal is it's a combo tag. You can shoot one bear and six deer. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, yeah. Yeah. I go, do I have to shoot a deer? Cause I'll probably have a few in the freezer from my own property. He goes, well, the, the extra is the bear. I go, really? He goes, so you're actually buying a deer tag with a bear, like a bear stamp on it for yeah. the combo. So you're actually, you know, so the deer tag comes with, you can shoot six deer, four doe and two bucks. Hmm. Like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So Cass and I are headed to North Carolina in December. And then a week or two after that, we're headed back, to, back to Texas for the crane hunt. So, awesome. um, and then again, March we have the snow goose hunt. So and, and then in the spring we have you know Kendra's offered uh, the turkey hunt. Um, Audrey and Tyler are trying to put something together for uh, Osceola turkey hunt in Florida. So uh, all kinds of opportunities like you said. Now hey I'm gonna throw something out there. We we're talking about staffers applying from different areas. I know for a fact and I can probably speak for Sam on this. If you are from Hawaii, if you're from Hawaii, our wives would really really appreciate you to apply. Because <laughs> Especially if you have a beach house, because <laughs> the wife can stay at a beach house. The guys could go after some some axis deer. Yeah. <laughs> and from what I hear from Nick and Drew, axis axis is the animal that you really want. So axis if you're from Hawaii, you make sure you apply. <laughs> that yeah. would uh, certainly extend our reach and make our wives happy. How's yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, Hawaii would please the wives, and if you're from Alaska. By golly, I want your phone number. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we got something. We've talked about that, you know, trying to trying to get something set up with a caribou hunt in Alaska. So, yeah, yeah I mentioned that to Andy again. Andy goes, you want to go tomorrow? I'm like, well, I, I can't go tomorrow, but. <laughs> how, about the, how about next week? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, so. I mean, all, all jokes aside, it, it's, it's. It's awesome, and again, as we've mentioned a couple times now, if you're interested in learning more, interested in applying, um, fallobsession.com is the place to go. Get more info yeah, through sure. there. So, for sure. Well, Todd, we're getting to the end of our podcast time, at least. So we'll uh, yep. we'll wrap up the podcast. But I appreciate you coming back on and and catching up a little bit. And hunting season's right around the corner, so I imagine yep. we're going to be connecting a whole lot more on here when when uh, some deer start dropping. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm sure we are and it's it's that exciting time this is my favorite time of the year with with hunting you get into your you're, you're starting to head into the holidays and that's that's really our favorite time of the year as a family and uh, college football I love college football that that gets going next Saturday so actually starts today I got it on TV right now but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah 
best time of the year and, and, uh, and having those opportunities to go out in the woods and just hang out, relax, decompress, and just enjoy, enjoy what nature has to offer. That's, it's nothing can beat it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yep. Well, for our listeners, thank you all for listening. Appreciate y'all tuning in. We're going to be back on here again next week with another podcast episode. So be sure that you guys tune in and hit all the socials up and get your notifications turned on do all that good stuff show fall obsession some love and if you voted for us in the 2023 carbon awards thank you um at the time this episode is being published the uh the voting period is already closed we haven't heard the winners yet but fall obsession podcast was nominated for best podcast our texas dirt series got an honorable uh, nomination for best comedic moment so we're pending the results on those and we're looking forward to, to seeing what uh, that brings to the table. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we're an award-winning podcast now. It'd be pretty cool, but that would um, be really cool. But you know, I, you, you, it makes me chuckle when you say that we're up for the best comedic moment, because I think of all the camps and stuff and every time we're together, how many comedic moments happen when we're just together. <laughs> so what's funny is, so I got an email when, when all the nominations were made, I got an email saying the podcast has been nominated for best podcast. And of course, Oh my word, that's awesome. But yep. then I just, it just said, Texas dirt has been nominated for best comedic moment. And I'm looking at, it, I'm like, Okay, so like a clip from Texas Dirt, or are you saying like the whole show's a joke? <laughs> the right, whole right, show right, is worth a right. comedic moment. So right. I had I had to ask. I was like, okay, what specifically is is the comedic moment? That way I can start promoting it. And right, and, right. I, and I figured it would have something to do with the Prius. And sure enough, Nick's Toyota yeah. Prius out there on Texas Dirt got the yeah. got a comedic <laughs> moment uh, nomination on there. So I thought that was pretty, not, cool. not a traditional hunting vehicle, but it worked. No, Andrew. yeah, he, uh, he made it work for sure. So I, I thought yeah. that was pretty, pretty funny, but anyway, yeah. thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. We're back again next week. We'll catch you then on another fall obsession podcast. Yep. Yeah. Stay obsessed. Stay obsessed.